Sunday simultaneously this week, so I know you're like three weeks out, you know, and I didn't want to affect everybody like bumping up, so I said let me see if that will work for you, if a week will give you enough time or that's not enough time. Okay, I haven't started going to do it. Did it work last week too? Did you do it last week? Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Alright, because yeah, it's just, uh, yeah, it's just, because also, after next week, then the following Sunday, I'm up doing songs because it's five Sundays. Sorry. And then <laughs> she's getting better. Um, not slow, slow. Um, God willing, you know, they said maybe tomorrow they may release her. Pray so, formally for complete healing and salvation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Appreciate it. Not even. So, um, no problem. Of course, that's been another thing. Every morning before I go to work and every morning I get, when I leave, I go see my mom who's in the hospital. So it's been up at five, back home at nine. <laughs> so I come home, I eat, and I go to bed. So I'm hoping everything is smooth with her discharge. But just because of that, you know, they've discharged on Friday, but then she went back in the same evening and said everything was in good. So because of that, I was like, let me, just in case, let me plan early, because that's also affected, you know, the time to prep. So I said, let me come and ask you <laughs> ahead of time, because of all this stuff, if you can accommodate. So let me know, let me know if it's, you know. Hey, brother. Hey, what's up, man? Just real quick, remind us that you guys are on today. Um, I'm sure. Five, I'm, yes, you're on um, five, and you're on eight. Okay. 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 You know where that is, or you need? No, I need okay. your assistance. Okay. Eight, eight is eight is <laughs> this left side here uh -huh. from the back, and you move forward with the trays. Okay. Board supper and got no, try here. Six is in the corner. Am I getting my? That's oh, six okay. eight seven five. So okay. you're right here, number eight. Um, you're gonna take the um, Lord's Supper and you're gonna start in the back row and work your way this way. Okay. So you meet the person coming that. Okay. And then same thing for contribution. Sure. So, okay. Right? Okay, no problem. And you are five, you said? Yeah, so five, you're in the corner okay. over there. Okay. Same thing. Yeah. Okay. All right? So, what do you think? <laughs> Were you able to get anybody to switch? I'm talking to the men oh, right okay. now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you didn't get that far. No, no. Uh -huh. <laughs> that, that day was great. That was yesterday morning, yeah. right? I called you. I was like, let me let me see what the deal is. So, 
I, I, I know it's a, I know it's a lot of everybody. So it is what it is, you know. So because you know I've also been out of sync too because last week I was covering for Kev. I think that's when I was scared, and I may have reached out to you as well. You know, it's the week of his surgery, but I was like, all right, nobody can do it. I guess I'm the man. <laughs> you know, then a little tougher too. So I get it. So if you can, if not, then I just I just try and make it work. So if you can just let me know tomorrow. If not, then I'll I have to man up. <laughs> We got good, good. Minutes. How's it going? Oh, I appreciate it. Yeah, I got, I got like a couple. Watch this. It's just easy. Most of the other things. Thank you. I'm sure it's a good reminder of your fake too. Like if you're having a bad day. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. So. No, it's pretty cool. It's like I told you. It's like what my world. Um, he'll, he'll let me know tomorrow. Okay. Okay. If not, and I just... Yeah, just let me know so I can... Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, if not, I just... Uh, what was I, I just say? Oh, this is all my world's alive. Mm -hmm. like, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Oh, my world's alive. 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 The company has good form value, but it's very good. Kirk. So I, uh, I'm starting to see that. Good afternoon. Can I have everybody's attention, please? Can I have your attention? We're going to be starting today's worship service in a few moments. If you could all please come on in and start finding your seats. Again, we're going to be starting today's worship service in a few moments. So please come on in and start finding your seats. Thank you. Which is kind of messed up, right? But I guess he's the greatest of all time. <laughs> thank you for the cross, Lord. Thank you for the cross. Bearing all my sins, Lord, the King.
I've got a home in the glory land that outshines the sun. I've got a home in the glory land that outshines the sun. I've got a home in the glory land that outshines the sun. Way beyond the blue. So do Lord, oh do Lord, oh do remember me, my Jesus. Do Lord, oh do Lord, oh do remember me, hallelujah. Do Lord, oh do Lord, oh do remember me, way beyond the blue. I took Jesus as my Savior, you take him too. I took Jesus as my Savior, you take him too. I took Jesus as my Savior, you take him too. Way beyond the blue. So do Lord, oh do Lord, oh do remember me, my Jesus, do Lord, oh do Lord, oh do remember me, hallelujah, do Lord, oh do Lord, oh do remember me, way beyond the Good afternoon, Good afternoon, family and friends. Friend. Uh, welcome, welcome out to Launch Church of Christ Sunday, Sunday worship, worship services. services. Just have some opening open announcements before we open up in prayer. prayer. Our, Our next, next Devo will be, will be this Friday, Friday July, 7th. July 7th. So as always, so come, come early, early ready, ready to sing out and hear some great lessons, lessons by one of the brothers. brothers. That's, from That's from 8 to 9 p.m. And the 2017, the 2017 events. events. So, so we have the Harvest Campaign, the Church Barbecue, and VBS. All right, great. So. Today, today is, is the last, last day, day to sign up. Today, today is the last day to get your t-shirts. So, so if you haven't got a t-shirt yet, you want to get a t-shirt for VBS, today is the last day to get your t-shirts. But, but so let's pretend, pretend today is the last day to sign up for everything, everything. So, so the brothers, brothers can get everything squared, squared away and set up. So after services, head back there, sign up for everything, get your t-shirts, get signed up for VBS and the church barbecue and the harvest campaign, get that done with. We can do that? Amen. All right. <laughs> um, <laughs> right. Relationship Matters, matters course, uh, the, uh, the 27th, 27th August 30th, 30th without, without any calendar, calendar. and we ask that it makes, makes any noise, you turn off this time, time and, and only bottled water, water in the chapel, chapel building. building. Let's, Let's open up in prayer. prayer. Our mighty and great Father in God, uh, what, what a, a privilege it is, Father, to come together on this first day of the week, and we know Many, Many saints, saints throughout, throughout the world, world are gathering, gathering on this day, day uh, remembering, remembering uh, what, uh, your, what son your son did over 2,000 years ago and how blessed, how blessed we are, Father, Father to receive that forgiveness, to receive that mercy in our lives. And we just ask, Lord, that we will use this moment in time that you have blessed us with to uplift you in song and the men that will be leading us in song and in lessons. Use them bold them, Father. Have them prick our heart, have them cut our hearts to to realize how how blessed we are to be in you and how much more you want us to grow and to change and be more like Christ. That's what we are. We are Christians becoming more and more like Christ each and every day if we are listening to your word and obeying your word. We thank you, Lord, for this beautiful day once again. We just ask God to honor you at this time that you are pleased with it. It's in your son's amazing name we pray all things. Amen. 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 Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Today, we're Today we're going to be, be uh, reading our scripture from Romans, Romans chapter, chapter 8. eight. So, so, you know, we, we all know, know that, that life, life can, can be challenging, challenging at times. At times. Amen. 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 And, and, you know, we all, all go, go through, through at, at some, some, in some, in some form, form, we all suffer from, 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 from different things. things. And, and, and our sufferings can be different. Uh, depending, uh, depending on, on each, each individual, individual whether, whether it be physical, physical pain, pain, emotional pain, uh, dealing, uh, dealing with, with someone at the job. At the job. Um, um, but, but, you know, we, we know, know that, that, that there's going to be suffering, suffering in this in life. life. But, when but when you compare what we, what we have, have in the future, future right, when, right, when you, you really, really sit down and think about what heaven is going to be like and meditate on that for a couple of minutes, the Bible says that there is no comparison to the sufferings of this life. When we are in heaven, it is, it is going, going to be, to be so, so amazing. amazing. Amen? Amen. And, let's and let's read this, read this in, in Romans, Romans 8. 8. Verse, 18 Verse 18 says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. Amen? 
As a Jesus for the water, Lord, so my soul longs after you. My soul thirsts for the living God. Yes, my soul longs after you. And I pour out my soul deep within me. Deep within me I pour out my soul Oh me deeper Lord Deeper Lord in you Draw me deeper Lord Deeper Lord in you As the deep Thirst for the water, Lord. So my soul longs after you. My soul thirsts for the living God. Yes, my soul longs after you. And I pour out my soul deep within me, deep within me, I pour out my soul, oh me deeper Lord, deeper Lord in you. Lord, deeper Lord in you. Good afternoon. How are you all feeling today? Amen. For those of you that know my wife and I, we're planners. You know, there are some people who are like spontaneous, just go with the flow, just roll with it. And while we've had to learn in Christ how to kind of be okay with changes in life, Deep down, that is just not how we roll. Um, for a planner, there is nothing better. There's no better feeling than seeing a, your plan come to fruition. So like last week, we had a big birthday party for the boys. And while the party itself was only a couple of hours, and it came and went like that, there was a ton of stuff. There were like homemade decorations that my amazing wife put together. There was all this food to prepare. There was all the guest list, how many people, right? All this time and energy went to prepare. Um, and, and, you know, late nights up the week before, uh, the, whole, the whole nine yards. But when all was said and done, the party was a huge success. The boys were, were thrilled. The kids had a great time. We keep getting compliments about how well it went from our family and encouraging words. And to that, it makes it all worth it. Because all that work was just worth it. It feels great. And it, it kind of makes me think about, you know, how does God feel when his plan came to full fruition? You know, now it's silly, it's a little bit silly to think this way, so bear with me for a minute. Because, you know, God is outside of time. God knew before anything happened that it was going to happen and what it was going to do. But, but, but for, just bear with me for one moment, if you will. You know, I want to think about the plan that God set in motion thousands of years ago. In fact, as we're going to read in 2 Timothy, this plan was put in motion before time even existed. In first, uh, sorry, 2 Timothy chapter 1, Verses 9 and 10, it says, He has saved us and called us to a holy life, not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. This grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time, but it has now been revealed through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus who has destroyed death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Just imagine how God felt when Jesus said, it is finished. It's easy for us often to imagine God as that, you know, father whose heart's broken because his son just died on the cross. But, 
you know, looking at it this way, it makes me think about that God is, is the, pl- the ultimate planner, and he's finally is seeing his plan of salvation for mankind come to full fruition. I imagine that the angels were rejoicing in that moment of Jesus' death because the focus point, the central point of God's whole purpose for mankind was there, being complete. Now, skeptics who don't necessarily believe the Bible might say, well, oh, 2 Timothy, oh, it's easy to say after the fact that that was God's plan all along, you know. Uh, hindsight's twenty twenty, as they say, right? Um, but I want to show you something that I saw recently that is just absolutely incredible, that proves that this was God's plan from the beginning, even for those skeptics. In Genesis 5, there's a genealogy, and I have it here. The first ten generations of men. It's Adam who had Seth, Seth had Enosh, Enosh had Kenan, Kenan had Mahalel, Mahalel had Jared, and then Enoch, and then Methuselah, and then Lamech, and then Noah, finally. And, you know, if anyone studied the, you know, they had a study Bible or whatnot, they'll know that all these Hebrew names had another meaning. Like, for example, most people know that Adam means man. What you might not know is Seth means appointed. Enosh means mortal. Kenan means sorrow. Mahalel means the blessed God. Jared means shall come down. Enoch means teaching, teacher. Methuselah means his death shall bring. Lamech means the despairing. And Noah means comfort or rest. Why is this important? If you look at the first ten names of the men in the Bible as a sentence, here's what you have. Man is appointed mortal sorrow. The blessed God shall come down teaching. His death shall bring the despairing comfort or rest. Isn't that amazing? I had to share that. It was just so incredible. God's plan of salvation from the very beginning. And honestly, this isn't just a plan, but when God makes a plan, he leaves no loose ends. He made sure that it would be utterly clear for those with eyes to see this plan coming to fruition. So as we take the Lord's Supper, I want you to think about it, that you're here not by mistake. This is no accident. In fact, God was planning on it since before the beginning of time. Amen? Please bow with me. Our dear God, our Heavenly Father, we just thank you for just that awesome reminder of how far above our ways your ways are. The way you think, the way that you plan is just so beyond us, it's impossible to describe. And right now we're thankful for that plan. Because of that plan, we have hope in you. We have the chance to be saved by your precious blood, Lord. And we're thankful for those of us within um, this building here who have taken up that chance to become part of your body, to be baptized for the forgiveness of our sins. And as we think back on that plan, we know that as men we may resist parts of it. We know that as your son was praying, he said that if it's possible, let this cup pass. But we know that ultimately he went through with it. He allowed himself to be put on the cross, to suffer and to die for that plan to be fulfilled. And because of that, we say thank you, Lord. Right now, as we we partake of this bread, which represents the body that was on the cross, we just pray that we would reflect upon it, think upon what he did for us, and just be overcome with gratitude for it. So again, again, Lord, we thank you for your salvation, your love, and your mercy. And it's in your son's name we offer this humble prayer. Amen. Amen.
Refine as fire My heart's one desire Is to be holy Set apart for you, Lord I choose to be Holy, set apart for you, my master, ready to do your will. Refine as fire, my heart's one desire. Is to be holy, set apart for you, Lord. I choose to be holy, set apart for you, my master ready to do your will. Lord, I'm ready to do your will. Amen. Please bow with me. Dear God in heaven, we thank you, God, so much, Lord, for allowing us to come here before you. Uh, we just come before you now thankful for all the things that you do for being with us, for loving us, for just showing uh, just an unparalleled and unconditional love that can never be matched, Lord. We just pray, Lord, that we may do our best to <clears throat> continue to put you before all things. Allow us to make you our number one priority. We know, Lord, that we get tied up with different things in the world, but you, you never do that, Lord. You always have us at the forefront of your mind and you sent your son to prepare a way for us to be with you one day in heaven. We just pray as we drink of this cup, Lord, that we may look at how we can improve our walk and continue to do that, Lord. It's in your son's name we pray these things. Amen. Amen. Beautiful Lamb of God, guiltless and pure as snow, gentle and merciful. Beautiful Lamb of God, sent from the Father's love, sent from the throne above, sent to redeem us with his blood. Beautiful Lamb of God, 
guiltless and pure as snow, gentle and merciful, beautiful Lamb of God. Behold the Lamb of God, suffering great shame for us, and by His wounds we all are healed, beautiful Lamb of God, guiltless and pure as snow, gentle and merciful, beautiful Lamb of God, like sheep we've gone astray, each turn to his own way, but Jesus will take our sins away. Beautiful Lamb of God, guiltless and pure as snow, gentle and merciful, beautiful Lamb of God. Amen. Lord, the light of your love is shining in the midst of the darkness shining. Jesus, light of the world, shine upon us. Set us free by the truth you now bring us. Shine on me. Shine on me. Shine, Jesus, shine. Fill this land with the Father's glory. Blaze, Spirit, blaze. Set our hearts on fire. Flow, river, flow. Flood the nations with grace and mercy. Set forth your word, Lord, and let there be light. Lord, I come to your awesome presence from the shadows into your radiance. By the blood I may enter your brightness. Search me, try me, consume all my darkness. Shine on me. Shine on me. Shine, Jesus, shine. Fill this land with the Father's glory. Blaze, Spirit, blaze. Set our hearts on fire. The Lord river flow. The Lord the nations with grace and mercy. Send forth your word, Lord, and let there be light. So shine, Jesus, shine. Fill this land with the Father's glory. Blaze, Spirit, blaze. Set our heart on fire. The Lord river flow. The Lord the nations with grace and mercy send forth your word. Lord, and let there be light. Send forth your word. Lord, and let there be light. Amen.
Amen. I hope you are blessed this Sunday afternoon. Danny, thank you for sharing that passage. The Word of God is amazing. Amen. The more we look into it, the more we get to understand and conform to our Lord Jesus Christ. Matter of fact, 2 Timothy 1, uh, verse 9, which Danny had up on the board, said, He has saved us and called us to a holy life, not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. There is a grace that God has given us that we as his people shall not squander it. We have to let that grace work in us, conform us to our Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, Jesus is coming soon, but he gave us his spirit to work with us while we're here on earth, and he gave us his word. Word, uh, faith comes from hearing the message. And as we hear the message, we are filling ourselves with Christ. You want to get to know your Lord Jesus before he actually comes and makes an appearing? You can and we must through the word of God. As we look into the word, we can understand the calling he has given us to live this holy life, which entails being men and women of God. Not deviating from that st standard as, the, as we see the world doing. The world does not know how to be people of God. That's not their interest. But us, whom we've been called out of the world, we understand that we're not holy. We understand what God wants us to be. So more and more, we want to seek God, be conformed to Christ through his word. And some of the things that I've been sharing with you are ways of practicing this conformation to Christ. We spoke at length concerning women, how women should conform to Christ. What is what God calls them to do to live a holy life? And I started touching on that for men as well. The uh, last week or a few weeks ago, we talked about understanding headship. And part of understanding that headship is understanding the obligations of that headship that God has given us. So I'm going to start with 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7. There are two main passages that God directs to men as far as their responsibilities are concerned, being men of God. One of them is 1 Peter 3, 7. The other one is Ephesians 5, which we'll get to later. And in this command and this exhortation that God gives men, he says, husbands, live in the same way, be considerate as you live with your wives and treat them with respect as the weaker partner and as heirs with you of the gracious gift of life so that nothing will hinder your prayers. Understanding your wife's vulnerability to you is one of eight obligations that we're going to see in these two passages directed to men as far as understanding their role under Christ. So this one, understanding your wife's vulnerability, vulnerability to you, is expressed in the sentence, Can be considerate as you live with your wives and treat them with respect as the weaker partner. So to be considerate, as the uh, NIV states here, uh, is to be understanding. God wants you to live in an understanding way with your life. And this is really tough for some guys to accomplish that. We're to actually, as we are husbands, as we uh, practice being the head of our household. And this goes, by the way, for anybody who is a head. Anybody who is a head, even if you're the boss at your job, if you want your relationship with your workers, with those you oversee, to be fruitful, this also applies to you because it's a spiritual principle. Remember, this is directed as husbands in their relationship to wives, but I believe it is a spiritual principle directed to anybody who has a responsibility of headship or overseeing anybody else. If you are going to be an adequate head, a godly head, you are directed to be considerate towards those that are vulnerable to you, as Peter says, those who are the weaker vessel. So this command 
the, the aim, the thrust of this passage is for us to live in an understanding way, to live with our wives, to live with those we have authority over according to knowledge. There is something that we need to understand. And this is directly related to our wives being that weaker vessel. And this is one of the reasons, I believe, why Satan tried to undermine man's relationship with God by going after the woman's vulnerability. Remember I shared with you some time ago that we were going to discover why was it that perhaps Satan decided to go after Eve instead of Adam first? I believe this is one of the reasons. Because Eve, being in subjection to Adam, that already made her vulnerable in her relationship to Adam. So Satan loves to exploit vulnerability. And that's where he's going to go. Just like a lion, when a lion is prowling around and looking at a herd of buffalo or gazelles, who is the lion going to go after? The lion is go going to go after the most vulnerable creature, perhaps uh, the, the children, those who are younger, maybe those who are sick or weak in one way or another. That's where they're going to go first. Satan also undermined God's relationship with Adam and Adam's relationship with Eve by going after her. So our head, who is Christ, that makes us vulnerable to Christ because he is our head. Satan understands that weakness as well, which is why he aims to come after us. Now this command is not directed not directing us necessarily to understand women in general. Uh, good luck to you in, in doing that. Uh, like many relational books try to attempt to do, men are from Mars, women are for Venus, and other such titles. Uh, that's not necessarily what the passage is encouraging us to do or to understand the particular qualities of our life. Not that there's anything to gain from that, absolutely. That wisdom is great and we, are, we will uh, be doing that. But this one is not necessarily related to understanding that particular aspect. I believe this understanding is specifically tied to the understanding of her vulnerability. Basically, let's talk about this weakness, okay? What does it mean by weakness? The weaker partner or the weaker vessel. Let's examine that first. Weakness does not imply inferiority. In 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7, he says it right there. He says, treat her as fellow heirs. So right away, the Holy Spirit wants us to understand that she's not the weaker vessel because she's less meaningful, because she's inferior or less valuable. Not at all. That's why he says, you're fellow heirs. Often, the object with the, with the greatest value tends to be the most fragile. We are fellow heirs with our wives. We have equal value. We're not better because we're supposedly stronger, whatever that may mean to you. You know, right away, this equality is established in the passage. We are equal in God's sight as far as our value is concerned. The only place we don't have equality in God's sight concerns the role God has assigned us as men and the role God has assigned to women. That is not equal. That is not the same. But that is not tied to our worth in God's sight. Often the world tries to play against you in that way, don't they? They say, oh, you have to submit to your husband. That means you're not that important. Who said that? God didn't. The world kind of wants to make it look bad. Or maybe that's Satan, right? Working through the world. Trying to what? To uh, attack uh, your vulnerability in the eyes of God. That's really what it is. So it doesn't mean inferiority, as we saw here, that underlying part, they're heirs with you. So we're both valuable. It also doesn't mean physical weakness necessarily. This weakness doesn't necessarily talk to the absence of strength. Yes, we can say there's a disparity in physical strength, you know, men tend to have more muscle mass. I'm speaking very generic, of course. Uh, women have remarkable inner strength, not necessarily physical per se, but emotional strength. Some women show an incredible amount of inner fortitude required when they go through certain things. And 
I know many of you have heard of the reference, right? That women can go through a, a birth. Try to get a man to go through that, maybe. That wouldn't happen. <laughs> so we know that women are very, very strong. God had them go through that. Uh, yes, physically in the sense of brute muscular strength, perhaps we can make a general statement saying that men tend to have more. But women... Uh, are just as well or perhaps even better when it comes to strength of character like emotional strength or like pain threshold as in giving birth you know that may surpass ours I like the passage in Proverbs chapter 31 that speaks of the women's strength she compares the woman to a merchant ship I mean these ships are really huge right bringing their good bringing their food from afar and it talks about how she gets up while it's still night. She provides food for the family, portions to her female servant. This requires a lot of work, which requires endurance, which requires strength. It says she considers a field and buys it. Out of her earnings, she plants a vineyard. This sounds like a busy woman. Very, uh, she sets about her work vigorously, it says. Her arms are strong for the task. So the Bible does not demean women's physical strength. If anything, in Proverbs 21, it's an attestation to the fact that women can also be physically strong. So what is this vulnerability or this weakness talking about? I believe it's, like I said before, a vulnerability to headship. Uh, ladies, the Bible says you are weaker because you're vulnerable to your husband. What does that mean? Well, her weakness is relative to my relationship with her. The Bible says treat her as the weaker partner, weaker because she's in subjection to me. I must be considerate how I'm dealing with her because God already has put her in subjection to me. Automatically, that's gonna make her weaker because she needs to depend on me. And I may not know what I'm doing, you know? Uh, I have to speak to her, to be considering how I speak to my wife, the tone of voice that I use, the volume, the gestures that I use with her. Not be like, but, you know, be kind and smile and things like that. Think about this. You could be a really strong guy, right? Six foot four, you know, the body of the Hulk. But... If your boss, and your boss can be this little guy with glasses, yeah. and that makes you vulnerable to your boss, doesn't it? Because your boss has authority over you, automatically you're weaker in that relationship. That's what he's talking about here. That's the kind of weakness he's talking about, and that's why God says live with her in an understanding way. Don't abuse the authority. Don't take advantage of the fact, you know, the little guy with glasses, he might, you know, have insecurity issues, and he might tell this guy that looks like the Hulk, well, go do this, go get me a cup of coffee, and try to, you know, do all kinds of things, because he, you know, he feels strong, he feels like he's in control, he feels powerful by doing things like that. Similarly, a man, because he's the head of the house, might think, you know, God gave him a lot of latitude to command and do all kinds of uh, things, and you might think that, you might, that might feed your ego, be careful, God says, that's not why you're the head to feed your ego. You're there to serve. Be careful how you address her. Be respectful in your relations with her, in your communication with her. Treat her as someone you cherish, and we'll be speaking about this cherishing later on. Lavish your patience on her, your kindness, just as Christ has lavished his grace on you. Don't be like in the parable of, uh, of the guy who owed a lot of money. Uh, and he, here was this guy who owed him some money. And he strangled the guy because he owed him a few bucks. And then meanwhile, he owed the king thousands and thousands of dollars. And the king decided to forgive him. But then he went back to the guy and started to choke him and says, you're not, you're not sharing, you're not passing along this grace that you've been shown. God wants us as husbands to remember that he's been very graceful to us. He has not treated us as our sins deserve. Therefore, we need to live with our wives in a considerate way 
treating them with respect, showing patience, showing humility towards them as God has shown them to us. This is true, like I said, in any relationship with a figure of authority. Masters or bosses are called to treat their employees with respect without threatening them. It says so in Ephesians 6 verse 9. He says, treat them in the same way. Don't threaten them since you know that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven and there's no favoritism in him. This shows you that the spiritual principle applies across the board. It's just that we're exploring more specifically in 1 Peter how husbands should treat their wives, but it's a spiritual principle across the board. Anyone under a figurehead is vulnerable to that head. That's sometimes why we don't like to work for someone else, right? We don't like to be told what to do. But everybody ultimately has a boss, don't they? Everyone ultimately has someone they have to answer to. Maybe except for the president, I don't know. <laughs> well, yeah, he answers to God, doesn't he? And that is scary. But husbands, we directly answer to God himself. God wants you to be considerate. God wants you to understand. He wants you to have knowledge about what it is to live with your wife. Consider the latitude, the love, the grace Christ has lavished on you and decide to pass that forward to your wife. Later on when we talk about how Christ covers the sinfulness of the church. Christ makes the church unto himself as radiant and blemish without stain or wrinkle. This is going to be very important when we get to that. If you're not lavishing that grace, you're not going to be able to cover her as Christ covers us. Now, think about this. We, you know, God wants the wives, right? He wants the ladies to get behind their husbands very eagerly, very vocally, very wholeheartedly, uh, submitting to them, showing chaste respect. And now God says that we as husbands need to lead them in an understanding way. We need to understand what God has done, how God has put them under this headship, and lead her in that way, in a very spiritual way. Now, what does that tell us? That tells us that we have a priority here. We don't want to make our priority in life anything else except making sure that we are the best head to her as Jesus is to us. Your career or your job, whatever it is that you do during the day, whatever you get paid for, is not more important than that calling. You get that? Your job, your career, whatever you get paid to do, is not more important than what God is expecting you to do with your wives as head of household. Your recreation on this earth is not more important than that calling. Husbands, we need to be on our knees desiring to get in line with the expectations God has for us as we lead our wives, as we lead his daughter. Think about this. If all of a sudden you were put in charge of a big multinational corporation, all of a sudden you were the CEO, you got that position, and hundreds of shareholders uh, are going to be calling you, are going to want to know what are you doing to make this company succeed. Your job is on the line. What would you do knowing that? Wouldn't you be up all night studying, trying to make sure that you're capable of meeting the challenges, trying to make sure you're prepared to know, to understand what your responsibilities are as the CEO and making sure that you execute them appropriately to be responsible to those shareholders? Wouldn't you want to do that? You'd be all psyched to do that, wouldn't you? Just like you were when you got probably the late last job you had, or maybe not, I don't know. But what about this charge God has given you? Is it less important or is it more important? What do you think? Isn't it more important? 
Some of you who have daughters, some of you dads who have daughters, I think you're going to understand God's seriousness when it comes to pairing your daughter to another man. Some of you have daughters right about that age. Some of you have daughters that are looking to get engaged soon. Some of you look at your baby daughter, you're like, no, not yet, not in a long time. I think that you can get, have an idea of how God feels about his daughters under the likes of you. Are you showing that you take this seriously? I know some of you are going to have the talk when your daughter gets to be about maybe 16, 17, maybe no younger than that, right? 16, 17. Some of you know 20, 25, <laughs> 30, 35. <laughs> you know, and she comes, she's telling you, Daddy, you know, I, I really like this guy. Hopefully it's going to be, I really like this brother, right? I mean, that's what you expect to hear. Not this guy, this brother. And right away, if you haven't had the talk, you're going to have it soon. Right away when you meet this young man, you're going to be taking him to the side, won't you? And explaining to him what your expectations are. What are you doing with my daughter? Where are you going to go if you're going to go out? Where are you going to be? What time are you going to come back? I mean, you are concerned about who your daughter is going to go out with, aren't you? Well, in the same way, I believe God is very concerned about how us men are going to treat his daughter, your co-heir, your fellow heir, whom God has put under subjection to you because there's something, there's a trust, he's entrusting you to guide her in a certain way, the same way that he has entrusted children to our. That's why when you look at this passage a little closely, look at that last clause. What does it say? There's a warning there, isn't it? He says, so that nothing will hinder your prayers. That's, that's the warning that God is giving us men. He takes it very serious how you treat his precious one. Your own access to God is at stake based on how you treat, how considerate you are being with his daughter. If you don't live with her in a conscientious way, if you don't live with her attempting and giving it your all to understand this vulnerability she has to you, your prayers may be hindered. That is a promise from the Holy Spirit. Your domestic life has a meaningful impact on your spiritual life. Men, this is where the connection is. And this is just the first one. As we go through, you're going to see how your domestic life is intrinsically attached to your spiritual well-being. You know, can you imagine losing your access to God? Can you imagine you praying, fervently praying to God, but because you have been so inconsiderate with your wife, God is like, don't even. I'm not listening. You have to get your act together if you want me to listen to you. That's what he's saying. Maybe that's why for some of you, have you ever thought about this? Maybe for some of you, God is not responding to you because maybe you don't care anymore. Maybe you've given up. I'm not saying you're not praying. I believe you might be praying. But you got this dark cloud over you. Why is that? Maybe God is repulsed by the way you're treating your wife. You're not treating her with consideration. Do you think you can get away with leading, being ahead of a household, by the seat of your pants? Imagine if a CEO of a company tried to do that. I mean, he'd be out very quickly. Can you afford to indulge your sinful passions, even for an hour, with what's at stake here? with what God is expecting from you. Your eternal life is at stake. Are you as thoughtful? Are you as prayerful about leading your wife as you are about your career, about your job? As much thought as you give to your job every day, are you thinking at least that much about how you're leading your wife, about what God expects of you? Do you pray about that? What is your mission for your family? 
And here's the challenge for you guys to understand headship and this consideration we're discussing here. Can the members of your family articulate your values and your objectives? You might be a really good boss in your job. You might be really good at what you do. But what about at home with what God expects? What about your headship there? Can your family articulate what your mission as a family is? Have you made that clear? I mean, don't you ask those of you who have daughters, or maybe not yet, but maybe you will soon be asking, a young man that might present himself, where are you taking my daughter? Where are you going? What are your plans? What are you planning to do? Where are you planning to live? What are you... I, I mean, you at least think that way about her, but how are you thinking about your wife? I remember when I was courting my wife, my father-in-law and my brother-in-law, they had the talk with me. As soon as I made my intentions known to my father-in-law that, you know, I wanted to marry his daughter, he took me to the side, says, come into this room. <laughs> And, uh, you know, he made sure. He wanted to know what I was doing. Where was I going? What was I planning to do? And I respected him for that. His mind was where it needed to be. And her brother as well. He took me to the side and he threatened me. He says, I know where you live. <laughs> he says, if you don't treat her right, I'm coming after you. And I believe him. Of course, you know, I want to treat her right because of God. And I know that if that's my first focus, everybody else will be pleased with that. When I was courting my wife, we didn't hang out alone. I spent my time getting to know her in the context of spending time with her family. I understood that the commitment that I was going to make was not just to her, but to her family. And I understood that her dad was looking at me the way he was looking at me. And I wanted to let him know that God's mission and work was on my mind. And that I, as best as I could, as best as the faith God gave me, was going to live in an understanding way with his wife. We spent a lot of time together, but not alone. We spent a lot of time together with her family and with the church family. And the reason I'm saying this is because this has a lot to do with this headship and this living with her in consideration in an understanding way it needs to start young men now I'm talking to you before you get married and you need to start thinking that way of the responsibilities and the expectations God has for you before you get married you need to prove you are a man of God in search to fulfill the mission God has given to you on this earth I didn't just get to know my wife between the two of us. That came after the wedding. Before the wedding, my goal was to get to know her in the context of the church and in the context of her family. My intentions were to show the kind of man I can be to his daughter. So my in-laws got to know me as I got to know them and their daughter. This is the kind of accountability an expectation God has for you. See, because marriage is not your business alone. It's everybody's business. That's why weddings are public knowledge. That's why the celebrations are public. When you get married in this church, it is the church's business. It is all our business what you want to do. When you court, when you're interested in a young lady, or a young lady, if you're interested in a young guy, that is the church's business. You need to go public with your intentions. Because if you keep things in the dark, that's where evil lurks. And that's where Satan is going to attack you when you're most vulnerable, when you keep things in the dark. Make your intentions known. And in that, seek to be noble in them. Don't invite Satan right off the bat in the beginning by keeping things in the dark. This is the instruction Paul gave the Thessalonians through the Holy Spirit. He says, it is God's will that you keep away from sexual sin as a mark of your devotion to him. 
as a mark of your devotion to God. See, because if you're pursuing a wife or a husband, and yes, I get it, you know, we do have needs, and that's fine, God understands that, which is why we keep away from sexual sin in our pursuit of this. That right there is our mark of our devotion to God, the, the showing, the sign that we're keeping God first in this relationship, even before there is one. We're putting God first. And that's how God will bless you. That's how you honor God. That's how you will find blessing in Christ. That will be the foundation of your headship. This purity that you seek to show from the get-go. Verse 4, this is God's word version I'm reading because it is the best translation, by the way, of this passage is in God's word. Each of you should know that finding a husband or a wife for yourself is to be done in a holy and honorable way. See, it's not just when you're married that you want to be practicing holy and honorable things. No, it's before you get there. You establish the foundation of headship before you even have a home. Verse 5 says, not in the passionate, lustful way of the people who don't know God, the people of the world, they don't know what commitment is, what marriage is. This is the warning here concerning these relationships. It says, no one should take advantage of or exploit other believers in that way. See, if we do it the way of the world, by listening to our heart, by trying to feed our passions of the flesh, we're going to end up taking advantage and exploiting one another. That's one of the ways Satan creeps his way into the church and mars that plan God has for your family from the beginning. It says, the Lord is the one who punishes few people for all these things. We've already told you and warned you about this. God didn't call us to be sexually immoral, but holy. Therefore, whoever rejects this order is not rejecting human authority, but God who gives his Holy Spirit. I wanted to read to you just so that you know that it's not just this church that has these expectations. No, this is an expectation from God on how you should even court one another. And I'm using the word court, not date. Date is a worldly concept. You really need to toss it by the side. We're talking about how to court, which in this uh, verse is how to find a husband or wife for yourself. Verse 4. How do you do that? Well, we can talk about that if you want. But this verse says it should be, the mark of it should be your purity and how you do it. And how you go about seeking it. Acting in passionate lust is really a sign of unbelief and a sign of gullibility that you've bought into uh, Satan, what Satan is selling out there. So the gist of this passage that I just shared with you in 1 Thessalonians is really in keeping with Peter's command to the husbands. Because if our marriage is not founded on this purity and this chastity that we need to be showing each other and how we treat each other, we're not following God's pattern. We're going to end up exploiting one another, acting in lust. Husband, how do you act towards your life? Are you acting in a lustful, in an ungodly way like the world? Or are you seeking to be considerate and live with her in an understanding way? If you don't get respect during courting, you probably won't get it in your marriage. Because the mark of devotion to God during courting is that sexual purity and it will be so even after you are married I'll give you some examples of how this chastity and purity in relationships continues even after you're married I have made it a policy myself not to meet other women by myself I'm a minister I do a lot of counseling but if some female needs counseling and needs to meet with me, I will usually ask her mentor to be there as well if my wife cannot be there. As a mark of my devotion to God. As a mark of holiness and purity. If I text or email a sister or a woman, I include her husband if she has one in that email or text. If not, then I'll include my wife in that email or text just so that I am open and transparent in all my communications so that I don't give the devil 
a foothold. I seek to grow in chastity. I'm really trying to grow in my marriage as a mark of my devotion to the Lord, who is my head, and as a mark of the headship, of a holy headship towards my wife. And brethren, we really need to look at each other in this way. We want to treat married people as a couple. I know we have that very individualistic way of thinking. But when I think of a married couple, that's exactly what they are. They, they're both of them. They're not just one. They're both. They're a unit. And I ought to treat them in that way. They are not single. They are a unit. And I encourage all the young folk here, young guys, young ladies, single men, single women, if you're going to address, for example, if a single lady wants to talk to a guy that is married, I urge you to do so in the presence of his wife or another sister. And if you have any communications with him, I urge you, if you're going to text him or email him, to do so and include his wife in that communication as well. And that way we are more forced to think of this mark of holiness as our devotion to God. Because we need to grow in this consideration of how we treat one another so that Satan doesn't take advantage of us. Are you courting? I know there's a few of you that have already come to me. You're getting ready to put the ring on the finger. Be open about it. Be public about it. Uh, seek pre-marriage counseling as soon as possible. Let's glorify the Lord by showing him how devoted we are to him by keeping our relationships with one another pure. Don't take advantage of someone's vulnerability, but make yourself vulnerable as Jesus did for our sake. He made himself nothing, became a servant, and he died on the cross so that even though he is all-powerful, we now to take advantage of the fact that he made himself vulnerable. Now, when I say these things, I want to let you know, I'm not trying to make you feel guilty. I'm not trying to be heavy-handed. I'm just preparing you for the judgment seat of Christ because Jesus is the one who judges. He's been entrusted all judgment from the Father. And so I want us to be prepared as a church because God wants to use us but he's not going to. He's, going, he's not even going to want to listen to our prayers unless we are really being considerate about how we're treating one another, especially you husbands, how you're treating your wives at home. And as we're courting each other, we need to make sure we're doing it in holiness. I don't know about you, but I want to be used as God's uh, vehicle for the salvation of many people in this area. And I don't want to jeopardize that by giving in to passions and desires. And I hope that you are with me on that as God's holy church. We've been called to live a life of holiness. Jesus showed us his vulnerability, showed us his headship, not by being heavy-handed with us, which he could have. I mean, we deserved it. Treating him as our enemy rejecting his holy ways, rejecting his grace. We were called enemies of God. But right in that instance, while we were sinners, while we were his enemies, God decided not to be heavy-handed, but to be graceful. And through Jesus Christ showed us that grace by having him become vulnerable before our eyes. God the Creator, Jesus the Creator, becoming a man, suffering at the hand of Romans, being flogged, whipped, being hit on the head, being spat upon, and ultimately being hung on a cross to die for everyone to see so that nobody can doubt that God's desire is not to be heavy-handed with us, but to show us grace. He who is the head made himself vulnerable. Let that be the pattern, men, that you look to by when you want to set the example in your households. What God, your head, Jesus Christ, did for you so that you can get to know his love. How is your wife going to get to know your love? By you being heavy-handed with her? By being curt with her? By threatening her? Or you, if you're a boss or a head over some other people at your work, how are you going to let God's grace be known? 
Is it not by conforming to Christ in the way he showed himself to be? A head full of love, giving us a chance for new birth? I invite you now as you come forward to really think about this. Uh, think about how you've been, if there's been something on your heart, men, something that you think is impeding you being that kind of head in your household, well, I invite you to come forward and lay it at the feet of your head, Jesus Christ. After all, remember, you have a head as well. You can go to Him in confidence. You can plead with Him to help you understand how to carry your responsibility better, to understand the expectation He has for you, because all that He wants for you is to be blessed as you do this. But don't let your ego get in the way. So as we stand and sing the song of invitation, I welcome you to come forward, lay down your prayers and your requests. If any of you have not made Jesus your head, you can come forward as well and ask for baptism. We can uh, baptize you in the name of Jesus Christ so that you can receive forgiveness of sins and the Holy Spirit to get you started on living a holy life as Christ wants us to live. May God bless you. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind. But now I see it was grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How did that grace appear the hour I first believed through many dangerous doors and snares I
anxiety for me who caused this pain for me who scorned his perfect love amazing love how can it be that you my God would die for me amazing love how can it be that you my God would die for me so you left your father's throne above us so free and infinite your grace emptied yourself of all but love and bled for Adam's helpless race amazing love how can it be that you, my God, would die for me? Amazing love, how can it be that you, my God, would die for me? So boldly I come before your throne to claim your mercy immense and free. No greater love will ever be known for all my God is found out to me amazing love how can it be that you my God would die for me amazing love how can it be Desire, Lord, to serve you and my God, as the heads of our Thank you, Lord, for our heads around us. We know we fall so short of your Son, Jesus would Christ. Would die that's why we pray the grace of our lives. Not to be short or hurt, but to be uh, the kind of Jesus you have with us. Thank you for, for the patience you have with us. Thank you for Jaime, for Jaime. Every time I kneel to pray, I open up my heart to my Lord. At his job, so that through this test and whatever other things that he can do, he can share your grace with those at his job as he does it. And every time I close my eyes, I feel the sweet embrace. Of my Lord, I sing a sweet embrace of every time. I don't know why so many things seem to get in the way of seeing my. God's glory, but I try every day to see Him and to thank Him for all the things He's given me. Every time I see a child, I see the gentleness of my Lord. And every time I watch a storm, I know the awesome power 
of my I don't know why so many things seem to get in the way of seeing my God's glory, but I try every day to see Him and to thank Him. For all the things He's given me Every time I see a cross And can it be that I should gain An interest in my Savior's love Died for me, who causes pain, for me who scorned this perfect love. Amazing love, how can it be that you, my God, would die for me? Amazing love, how can it be that you, my God, would die for me? You left your Father's throne above, so free and infinite. Your grace emptied yourself of all but love and bled for Adam's helpless race. Amazing love, how can it be that you, my God, would die for me, amazing love, how can it be that you, my God, would die for me, so boldly I come before your throne to claim your Mercy immense and free, no greater love will ever be known. For oh my God, it found out to me amazing love. How can it be? That you, my God, would die for me. Amazing love, how can it be that you, my God, would die? That you, my God, would die. That you, my God, would die for me. Amen. We are so honored, Lord, as your people who need so much grace. We're honored that you have chosen to make yourself vulnerable to us and that you did so by dying on a cross, giving your life for us when we were so wretched. And we will continue to be wretched, Lord, because we've opened the door for sin. But we're so thankful of the grace that you continually administer to us. We're thankful, Father, we want to make that grace effective in us. We don't want to 
We don't want it to go to waste. But we are thankful that you help us see and that you've given us your Holy Spirit. You've given, it to, have given him to anyone who asks to drink freely from your fountain of life. And Father, as your church, we want to make available the spirit of grace. Help us be bold as we preach, as we share your gospel by word and in deed. Thank you for opening the doors in this community to your work and help us see our work here in your kingdom as a priority, as the priority, and also our headship in our homes as a priority over anything else we do in the world, Lord. Thank you so much for your instructions on how to live in holiness so that we can practice this purity as a mark of devotion to you, keeping away from the idolatry of sexual sin and temptation and the passions of the flesh. We know, Lord, that they have overcome those who live in the world, but we thank you that you've given us strength to stand in your word, in your gospel, and that we have confidence in that to be triumphant. Thank you for the righteousness that you've covered us with and help us as husbands and as men to understand what your expectations are in this life so that we can bring you glory. Thank you for the many partners that we have in the gospel together as fellow heirs with our wives and everyone else here as we take your gospel onto our community and also all over the world with many other partners that you've given us. Thank you for their generosity. And now, Father, as we give, we examine ourselves not just to give financially, because everything is yours. You own everything, Lord. And you've given to us. You're the one who's generous. But, Father, that is a mark of our devotion to you. Not only do we want to give generously, but also of our time, of the grace that you've extended to us, and the blessings that you've given us, to be generous, blessing back in every way that we can see. Thank you for helping us see those things. We pray in the awesome name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you for the cross, Lord. Thank you for the price you've paid. Bearing all my sin and shame, in love you came and gave amazing grace. Thank you for this love, Lord. Thank you for the near-pierced hands. Wash me in your cleansing flow. Now all I know is your forgiveness and embrace. Worthy is the Lamb seated on the throne. Crown you now with many crowns. You reign victorious. High and lifted up, Jesus, Son of God, the darling of heaven, crucified. Worthy is the Lamb, worthy is the Lamb. Thank you for the cross, Lord. Thank you for the price you paid. Bearing all my sin and shame, in love you came and gave amazing grace. Thank you for this love, Lord. Thank you for the near-pierced hands. Wash me in your cleansing flow. Now all I know is your forgiveness and Embrace worthy is the Lamb seated on the throne. Crown you now with many crowns. You reign victorious, high and lifted up. Jesus, Son of God, 
the darling of heaven crucified. Worthy is the Lamb, worthy is the Lamb, worthy is the Lamb. Okay, this brings our services to a close. Uh, we thank you for everyone coming out today. Uh, get together. With everyone invites you out here today, get together tonight, this week, and get together in God's Word to really study out uh, God's plan of how to have His mercy and grace upon your life. Um, so just highlight quickly, today is the last day to sign up for your VBS t-shirt. So we're going to do everything today, right? We're not going to mob it next Sunday when everything's closing down. We're going to get back there today. We're going to sign up for the uh, VBS, the Harvest Campaign, and for Relationship Matters. Um, we do have these nice uh, flyers for Relationship Matters. So for people you meet in the community, um, you can you know, talk to them about it if they're interested. Just don't hand them out like candy, free for all. Uh, you know, if they're interested, you don't want to see them on the floor. Um, you know, I would recommend that. If you have any questions about Relationship Matters, speak to our brother Rob Young and he can fill you in with more information about that. Um, one last thing here. Over here, this section is the AV crew section, okay? So we know we said no children over here. We don't want anyone over here. There's a lot of equipment over here, a lot of wires running around. So before, after, unless you're one of these guys, one of these AV guys that are working tremendously hard, um, you know, they set up when you know someone tripping on a wire or something. So no children, no adults, nobody, okay? This section over here, over here, we want to leave that complete to the AV crew. They're really doing a lot of great things, and we want to, you know, honor that request by them. Last thing, the children's ministry meeting is canceled for today. So if you're a teacher, you should have received a text this morning with your schedule and being uh, notified that today's ministry meeting is uh, canceled. Happy Fourth of July on that. And um, so we're just going to break out of here. If you didn't get a, a text and you need a printed copy, I have some printed copies. I know some of the younger people that are serving don't have phones and stuff like that. So I have some printed copies for you guys. Um, so I'll be right over there. Not over here once again. I'll be over here handing out those schedules. If I'm not here, I'll be outside with my children handing them out. Okay? You got it? Let's close in prayer. <laughs> Our mighty God, we just thank you. Uh, what, a, what a blessing it is, Father, to come before you, Father, in prayer, to speak with you, to the mighty and living God, thanking you for your precious word, Father. Uh, where would we be as husbands if we didn't have your direction, your word in our lives, Father. It would, it would be destined to destruction, Father. And we thank you, Lord, for using our brother Pedro to simply talk from your word today, uh, just to really lay your word out of what it means to be a man of God and really just living in holy reverence of what we've been entrusted, Father. We've been given a precious daughter. We've been given a precious woman of God. And we pray, God, for all the husbands that are here, we really take today's uh, lesson to our hearts and to our minds and that we are uh, leaving this building, uh, really just uh, treating our wives as they deserve to be treated, Father, with the utmost respect and dignity and really just loving them as you loved us and, and having that show in the community, Father. When people see our marriages, they just see something dynamic, something uh, completely different and unique than what the world is teaching us and how to treat marriages. And, uh, we thank you, God, for your word once again. Without it, we, we would be uh, failures, Father, in, in this area in our lives. And we just ask, Lord, that uh, we will just uh, meditate on this lesson, that we will implement, not only hear this lesson, but obey it this tonight, Father, beginning tonight, beginning today, to be more and more men of God and, and uh, loving our wives as you love us, Father. And we thank you again, Lord. We ask God just to, once again, just always have the heart of the, the, the gospel of Christ in our heart and our minds that we are uh, showing, telling people about the gospel and how it is obeyed and how we come into your church, how we are forgiven and how we are sanctified and made holy. I uh, thank you again, Lord. We, we love you and we pray this in your son's mighty name. Amen. I want to be a soul winner for Jesus every day. He does so much for me. I want to aid the lost sinner to leave his heading way and be from bondage free. A soul winner for Jesus, a soul winner for Jesus. Oh, let me be each day a soul winner for Jesus.
done so much for me. I want to be a soul winner till Jesus calls for me to lay my burdens down. I want to hear him say, Servant, you've gathered many sheep. Receive a shining crown. A soul winner for Jesus. A soul winner for Jesus. Oh, let me be each day. A soul winner for Jesus. A soul winner for Jesus. He's done so much for me.